Welcome to this week's service of the Des Moines United Methodist Church. We're glad to have you here to worship with us this morning, and we hope that you will invite your neighbors and friends as well. If you are here for the first time, we extend a special welcome to you. If you have any prayer requests, please call them into the church office. On Sundays, I would always invite you to greet those around you with the love of God. I now encourage you to reach out to those who may have sat near you in church or by you during coffee hour and greet them with the love of God. Welcome. With the ringing of the singing bell, I invite you to center yourself for worship. And if you have a candle anywhere close to you, please light it and set it in your worship space. And we'll begin with a few moments of meditation. I'd like you to close your eyes and relax. I'd like you to take you on a mental journey. You are in a womb. Feel the warmth, security, but also the feeling of being very crowded because there is another being in there with you. You are not happy. And when the time comes, you struggle to get out of there as fast and as first, but no. That other being is getting out ahead of you. So you grab his heel and hang on for all you are worth on the journey into the world. Now imagine yourself grown. You have never been alone since that birthing night. That's the way it is for twins tied together forever, no matter what happens or your, for you or your desires. It is clear you are very different from your brother, definitely not identical twins. You are smaller, no beard or chest hair yet, and you like hanging with your mom and she clearly favors you and you take advantage of that preference to get the things you want. So imagine that you are the elder of the twins by mere seconds. You have grown up to be what a man is supposed to be, large, a good hunter, and unlike your mama's baby brother, you have physically grown into a real man, hairy and all. And your dear old dad loves you best. Now imagine you have been out hunting all day. Smell and see the scrub trees and the animals you are hunting. 
and their blood as you are butchering and now you are on your way home. Suddenly, new pleasant smells assail you, so different from what you have been smelling all day, a delicious smell. Smell the lentil soup. Feel your stomach growl and your mouth water. What would you give to get some of that soup? Now, you are back in yourself making choices. Not as a grown hunting man, but you. Vision something you really want. What would you give to obtain it? It costs way more than you can afford. See it, feel it. What are you willing to give up to get this desired article? How do you choose what to do? Now picture your family, the one in which you grew up and the one you have created with a person you love. Is everything all happiness and love? Are there some small things that annoy you? Imagine a conversation with someone in your household. What is it about? Is it a positive conversation or getting a bit heated? Who comes in to join the discussion? Are they helpful or are they hindering your point of view? What words are you hearing? What are the tones? How do you feel? What do you say? What do you do? Okay, now back to the present. Remember your feelings and experiences. Hold on to them as we listen to the story of the brothers and their parents. As we hear about this dysfunctional family, does it make you a bit anxious or does it make you feel good? Hello, my name is Terry. Welcome to Time with Young People. We're so glad you chose to be here with us today. I have a case for you to solve today. It's a tough one. I'm going to give you some clues and see if we can figure it out. I'm confident that we can. I have it in my hand right here. Not even the smartest scientist who can design the most complex computers and machines can make these. It's something that many people buy and do something with every spring to enjoy later in the summer or in the fall. Yet no one can explain exactly how or why it works. There are many different kinds of this thing, but no one can create them. Any guesses? Ideas? That's right. It's a seed. There are all different shapes and sizes of seeds. You know what this one is? It's a green bean seed. We can study the seeds and learn how they grow, but no one can make seeds. Do you know how a seed grows? What does a seed need to grow? Water, dirt, Nutrients, sunshine, maybe a little love. What happens to a seed when it starts to grow? The sprout breaks out of the seed. It eventually pokes its way out above the soil. Before long, if the sprout has water and sunshine and good earth, it will grow into a plant, whatever plant it is supposed to be. Can a carrot seed grow into a marigold plant? Can a squash seed grow into a corn stalk? No, each seed grows the way that God has programmed it to grow. It is amazing to us to look at these little seeds and realize that inside each one, if the growing conditions are right, is the potential plant that will produce flowers or vegetables and many, many more seeds. The seed is a wonderful example for us of God's love. With God's love inside of us, wonderful things can happen as we grow into the unique people God created us to be. God's love takes root in us and grows. Just like the seeds grow to share their fruit and flowers, we share God's love with everyone we meet. We don't all grow exactly alike. We all have different choices to make, different ways to grow, 
and different gifts to share. But we all have the seed of God's Spirit inside of us. Let's do everything we can to help our spirit and all those we meet grow and thrive so God's love can make our world a better place. Nurture our seeds of love. Thanks for being here. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 to 34, the birth and youth of Esau and Jacob. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebecca conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau sells his birthright. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In the name of God who creates and liberates us, in the name of God who completes and perfects us, and a number of in the name of God who comforts and sustains us. Amen. I'm an only child. Most of you know that. And I am adopted. I'm special. My parents told me so. So much that when I was about two, I would introduce myself by saying, Hi, I'm Joanne. I'm special. I'm adopted. All one sentence. I knew that my parents thought the sun rose and set on my person. I was the center of their lives. They didn't have the choice, Isaac and Rebecca did, of favoring one child over the other. I was it. Everything was invested in me. There are pros and cons of being an only child. You are the only one you have to play with, but then you get good at entertaining yourself. You are around adults most of the time, but that makes you more confident about interacting with people older than you are from an early age. We are usually viewed as spoiled. Most only children I know are aware of their privilege and don't abuse it. I learned early on that if I said I like something, my dad would go out and get it for me. So I was careful what I said in front of him. My cousins affirmed that I was not spoiled. At least now as adults, they say that. I can give you the contact, my, contact stuff for my cousin Betsy that I talk to every week. She will confirm that. There's the drawback. You're the only ones making decisions for your parents as they get older or die. Positive. You are the only one making decisions for your parents. No sibling to argue with, only, with or bargain with or grow to hate as you disagree about assisted living, nursing homes versus being at home with help. 
memorial services, whether to have one or not, what to include and where it should be, the disposition of the body, and oh my, the estate, no matter how tightly drawn up the will or trust is written. Weddings and funerals oftentimes bring out the worst in people. Take Jacob and Esau and birthright. One's got it purely by accident of birthright order and doesn't value it highly. One wants it bad, encouraged by his mom, and will do almost anything to get it. Started even in the womb. Rebecca complains to God about all the movement she feels in her belly as she is carrying the twins. And God tells her they are going to go at it all their lives and two nations will be born from them. Not a lot of consolation to someone who is miserable in her pregnancy. The women out there ought to get that. Later on, they will be involved in intrigue when Jacob slips on an animal coat and steals the blessing from their dying father that was by rights Esau's. But I get ahead of myself. We continue the saga of Abraham's line and the stories and flawed people that populated. Welcome to episode two of Israel. Cue the theme music. For God's promise to come true, Rebecca has to have a child. She, like Sarah, has been barren. But at this point in the narrative, God hears Isaac and Rebecca's prayer, and Rebecca conceives with twins. Always be careful what you pray for. You may get more than you bargained for. The twins are antagonistic from the time of conception. When Rebecca prays that the unrest in her womb might cease, God answers that these children will always be divided as the elder shall serve the younger. Great. Just what you want to hear when you are super pregnant and World War, World War III is breaking out in your womb that this is going to continue long after birth. What joy to look forward with. The Hebrews in exile. This story of the reversal of social norms reassured them that God is with the underling and not the powerful. Yet Jacob could hardly be considered an underling. When it comes down to it, he takes full advantage of Esau's weakness in order to gain Esau's birthright. This is just the beginning of a series of incidents in which Jacob manipulates circumstances and people for personal gain. This is another very human story. The people and incidences are so messy and so real. The favoritism of parents for one child over the other. The uneasy relationship between siblings. Poor decision making and lack of insight, long sight, opportunism for self-gain. And yet, in all this, there is God, always present. We might recall the words of Jesus and quoted by Abraham Lincoln when he claims that a house divided will not stand. Yet from such a house, God creates the people of Israel. The house does not stand, really. Generations of animosity will exist between the descendants of Jacob and Esau, but God's love stands steadfast. We are reminded that nothing, not even family jealousy and resentment and selfishness, can separate us from the love of God. One might claim that a future of the two boys has been predetermined by the divine response to Rebecca's prayer. Yet it shortly becomes clear that Rebecca does not understand that God's response absolutely determines her son's futures. What she does or says assumes that she thinks that she can shape, shape that future. She enters into their lives in decisive, uh, in, at times, manipulative fashion, acting in ways she thinks will contribute toward the future of which God has spoken. The narrator makes no judgment on her activity. The oft-suggested idea that just by pursuing such activities, one seeks to take the divine promises into one's own hands, 
constitutes a view of the way in which God works in the world. God chooses to work in and through human activity in pursuing divine purposes. The future about which God speaks is not set in concrete. This is true of divine announcements in the future generally, particularly in prophetic material. These utterances express the future as God sees it or would like it to be or like to see it. God's knowledge of future human behaviors is not absolute. Moreover, the divine will can be crushed by human behaviors, though God's way into the future cannot finally be stymied. Why would God speak directly to Rebecca about such matters? God takes sharp risks in being misunderstood. Giving Rebecca or any human being such information will t tend to, to predispose him, her to act in certain ways towards her sons. Although she could have ignored God's word and actively worked against it, she chooses to tilt toward Jacob. The narrator has already reported Rebecca's preference, where she is said to love Jacob, and doubtless knows that this runs counter to Isaac's love of Esau. Let's face it, Jacob is a mama's boy, staying home, cooking, and being helpful around the house. Esau is a man's man, outdoors all the time, hunting and bringing back the food for the family. Esau is not particularly handsome. He is ruddy. The Hebrew word for red, Adamant, is a play on Edom, which is the nation that he will come from, and is also linked to the red stuff he will request from Jacob. The word for hairy, Sear, is, is a play on Seir, the region where the Edomites lived, and is linked with the deception Jacob will pull on his father later. When I was going through the ordination process, the board of ministry was the one who picked the scripture text on which we were to write a sermon. It would be one verse of something. I was having nightmares that it would be from Genesis and says, and Esau was an hairy man, but I, I am a smooth man. Jacob's name is a play on Akab, which means heal or grasp the heel, demonstrating the war in the womb to see who would be born first, with Esau winning that battle and being born with Jacob grasping onto his heel. That God chooses Rebekah and rather than Isaac gives this saying to seems remarkable given this patriarchal, patriarchal society. It suggests that God has more confidence in Rebecca than Isaac to carry out God's desires. It is hard to determine who acts more reprehensibly in this story. Both are guilty of violating basic family relationships, and any effort to excuse either one cuts against the grain of the text. Jacob takes egregious advantage of another person in need and sets the stage for family conflict. Esau comes off as a dullard, careless with family interests and despising the birthright. We do not know why God would choose either one to carry out God's purposes. There is also a divide of outlook. Esau was a man who lived only in the immediate moment and by the light only of what was obvious. He was heir to the birthright, and the birthright meant a great deal if you looked far enough. It meant the privilege someday of being the family's representative. It may have been an exaggeration to say that Esau despised his birthright, but he did disregard it. Its benefits were intangible and seemed a long way off. They did not fill the stomach when it was hungry. So when one day Esau came in from hunting, so famished that he was almost faint, and smelled some food that Jacob had been cooking, the birthright seemed very insubstantial in comparison with that steaming pottage that Jacob offered. 
What he wanted right then and there was something to eat. I am at the point to die, he said, and what good does a birthright do me now? So he made the deal. He wanted what he wanted when he wanted it, and the consequences could go hang. He lost tomorrow because he snatched so greedily at today. Jacob, on the other hand, was a planner and a schemer. Who knows whether he knew of Esau's habits and weakness and made the red lentil stew, knowing it would be tempting to Esau when he come, came in from hunting and used that knowledge to stealthily win the birthright he has desired and fought for since the womb. His actions not, may, may not be honorable, but he was thinking ahead to the future. But their actions divided the family and their descendants for thousands of years. A family divided happens all the time, probably over some trivial thing that builds up and no one can really remember why. Sometimes it's over major stuff and there's no will for reconciliation. The church is a family, and not just the local congregation, but the general church. Individual churches can and do have conflicts that drive a wedge between people or groups of people, and that is toxic. People can feel that when they come in the door, can feel that when they come in the door and probably won't be back. And I have known too many churches where this happens. But in the wider church, it is just as damaging when there is a divide among the members. In the mid-19th century, the subject of slavery was a hot topic in the United States. It divided the country mostly along geographical lines. And the same thing happened to the churches. The Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists were all debating what to do with slaveholders and abolitionists in the same denomination. For the Methodists, it came to a head in the 1844 General Conference when there was a movement to remove a bishop who was a slaveholder. Reconciliation could not be found. The bishop was supported by the Southern churches and opposed by the Northern churches. They decided to divide, which they did successfully, working out a dissolution plan concerning buildings, publishing house, and other financial and organizational details. And the church did not come together again until 1938, when the Methodist Church was formed from the MEC and the ME South, together with the Methodist Protestant Church. What seemed like a good idea after all, isn't unity what we want, turned into something um, that supported more division. The right to women's ordination that existed in the Methodist Protestant Church was eliminated. The central jurisdiction was formed to appease the South. It was where they put all the black churches, no matter their geographic location. These issues were not fixed until 1956 for women's ordination and full membership, and 1968 when the central jurisdiction was abolished with the merger of the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren to form our United Methodist Church. Why the history lesson? Well, I'm an historian by inclination and training, but more than that, the church is facing the same divide over LGBTQ plus people and their full inclusion in the church. The first time anything was put into the discipline was at 1972 General Conference when the incompatible to Christian teaching phrase was put in and it has gone downhill ever since. We have been discussing the issue for 48 years. I have been fighting the issue for 48 years and we are no closer to reconciliation than we were in 1972. Many of us are done talking. There is talk of schism, not along geographical lines this time, but according to a church's views and actions regarding LGBTQ plus folks and their full inclusion in all aspects of the life of the church. Right now, the United Methodist Church 
is a house divided, and it cannot stand. Some people are like Esau. They see things one way, and there is no deviating from that opinion. Some are like Jacob, looking ahead to the future, maybe contemplating whether their actions will fracture the church even further. But I don't think it is possible for there to be more of a divide in the United Methodist Church than exists now. And it is over more than LGBTQ plus folks. It is a basic divide in the church over theology and social issues. We are all coming in from hunting and are like to die if we don't get the spiritual nourishment we need. What are we trading away for immediate gratification? And is it worth it? We have got to start being the church that God calls us to be, engaging the community and the world, speaking out about issues of injustice, and then doing something concrete with, about them, instead of wasting energy and resources, spinning our wheels while the church goes into decline, because instead of leading from the front, we are the taillights of society. What will be lost and what gained? It's hard to tell, but something needs to be done. Red stuff or birthright? What will we choose? God told Rebecca that the divided lives of these people, that uh, the church is divided on issues, yet called to unity. This can be a burden and cause much heartache, but we hold on to the conviction that God works through all things, no matter what, and will not be limited by our prejudices and ideas of who isn't and is suitable as a vehicle for good. God does love us as we are, yet longs for us to be more our true selves. May it be so for you and for me, this day and always. Amen. Prayers of the people. Let us unite our hearts and our minds in prayer. God of each and all, we pray for our families, those with whom we are drawn together by birth or marriage or by adoption. May they receive care and love from you and from us all as well. We pray for our friends and neighbors, those with whom we are drawn together by common places of work or learning, by common aspirations and values. Strengthen the ties between us and may we find in these relationships the freedom the companionship and community that nurture us and the world around us. We pray for our fellow citizens, those with whom we are drawn together by birthplace and nation, by regional ties and societal traditions. Fashion these bonds to ensure the relationships and ideals we claim are paid more than lip service so that we who are and have been, never closes us to who we may yet become. We pray for those who are part of this community and in the whole Christian church, those with whom we are drawn together by a common faith and uncommon grace. So I want you to say the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of a strange time to do it. Yep, chat. Do you see it? There you go. You listen. And we're going to do the Lord's Prayer this time. Okay. Go ahead and start. Mm -hmm. We're ready. Go ahead. This is Steve Mannard saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, receive this benediction and blessing. And now, may we find the strength to right any wrongs, to be the peace brought to division, to be the love that is needed within the world. My friends, be in peace. Amen.